Lisa, thanks very much indeed. Three days until polling day and this morning we're going to look at the differences in policy between the three main parties on transport. From the future of British Rail to the cost of public transport, road building and the price of petrol, Conservatives, Labour and Liberal Democrats all offer different proposals for solving the country's problems. Well with us now are John Prescott, the Shadow Transport Secretary, Lord Tordoff, Liberal Democrat Spokesman on Transport in the House of Lords and in Edinburgh, Malcolm Rifkind, Secretary of State for Transport. Good morning to all of you. If I could start with you Mr Rifkind, what's actually going to happen to British Rail? Well, what we want to see is an end to British Rail's monopoly so that uh, all those who have an expertise in uh, transport, either in freight or passenger, can offer new services. It's already beginning to happen. And, of course, if you want to see an expansion of the rail service, you want to get uh, freight, for example, off some of our congested roads, the best way is to expand the railways. And the only way to do that is to make sure British Rail no longer remains the only company permitted to provide rail services on the railway. That's happening in other countries in Europe. We want to see it happen in the United Kingdom. Will you actually get that private investment, though? It's been a bit of an uphill struggle trying to get it, for example, for the Channel Tunnel. Are you actually going to get private investment? Are you going to be able to attract private investment? It's already beginning to happen. For example, one company has already reached an agreement with British Rail uh, to introduce a passenger, night passenger service from Aberdeen to London, which British Rail were proposing to withdraw because they couldn't run it as a viable proposition. So already we have an example uh, in uh, the north of the country uh, of a service being saved as a consequence of the introduction of the private sector. That's one example, but there is concern that people, will, that the investors will just invest in profitable lines and rural lines, for example, will just disappear. No, the very example I've just given you is not a profitable line. That's why British Rail were wanting to withdraw from it. Uh, the stagecoach, the company in question, believes it can actually run it efficiently. But I should emphasise that this will be in addition to the continuing subsidy that the government will be providing to ensure that all rural services, all local services will continue because the whole basis of our transport policy is to see an expansion of the rail network. It's begun to happen over the last three or four years. We've seen a lot of stations either opened or reopened for the first time. About 140 compares very favourably with the, uh, what happened during the last Labour government when investment in the railways actually fell. It's fallen under every Labour government despite their rather splendid rhetoric. Now, we're all supposed to be one big happy family in Europe. What are you actually going to do about links from the north in particular, from Edinburgh where you are, but from the north in particular to the Channel Tunnel? Well, that also is a very important emphasis. We've given uh, British Rail the resources required uh, for the, uh, both the freight services. Freight is particularly important because the carriage of freight from uh, the north of England, from the Midlands, from central Scotland will be infinitely easier once the Channel Tunnel opens. And, of course, throughout Europe, there will now be an ending of the rail monopoly of the various state-owned railway companies. Even the French and the Germans have accepted that that's now going to be necessary under European law. Only the Labour Party, because of trade union dominance here, is sticking out against that. Now, most people would agree that there are far too many cars on the road. What's your party going to do to make sure that there aren't as many cars, that we don't see the effects of pollution, so much pollution? Well, we've got to have a combined policy of road and rail. There again, I'm afraid there is a fundamental difference between our approach. The Labour Party wants to have a moratorium on the roads programme to switch resources to rail. We don't believe you should make that choice. We believe it's desirable to go ahead, for example, with many of the bypasses that people require. We have a commitment to the duelling of the A1 from north to south. Uh, we have uh, various other commitments of that kind, uh, which will mean a balanced system, but in addition to that, much greater controls over pollution. For example, at the end of this year, there will be a statutory obligation for catalytic converters in all motor cars, which will reduce substantially the amount of pollution. In addition to that, MOT tests now require tests on pollution emissions, and uh, we will also have, later this year, the introduction of speed limiters for all lorries to make sure that lorries cannot ever again break the speed limit. They will be physically prevented from doing so as a result of a government initiative. Well, Mr Rifkin, stay with us. Thank you very much indeed for the moment. Mr Prescott's with us. Good morning to you, Mr Prescott. Staggering report, that isn't it? You wouldn't think that the railway's daily experience is breaking down. You talked about private capital there, Mr Rifkin. Last week, he couldn't do a deal on the Paddington Heathrow because the problem of getting enough money from British Rail. The Jubilee Line's about to collapse because they can't find the crap of private capital of £400 million. The Sleeper Line uh, European services are now to be referred to the European Commission, so he couldn't sign that contract either. He doesn't know where the rail route's going to come for the channel tunnel and our freight system is falling apart and he keeps on saying we're going to end the monopoly I mean so I don't what would know you what do about it? How, how would you actually solve all these problems then? well what it's quite clear it? if, if you, you don't make it a condition first of all that the private money has to determine what is going to be the route as we've seen with the Jubilee line you can find money from the private sector but the public part of that money has to come in take the channel tunnel rail link he's already saying no public money can be in and he's actually passed it in legislation we would remove that get a combination of public and private money to do that Second 
secondly, we thought of new ideas of leasing. Mr Rifkin didn't say anything about it in York, and they've just produced a little leaflet now, a letter from his, his minister saying we might be able to give the money for the new railway link to replace the Kent linker. No definite guarantee about it, playing around with people's hopes and aspirations. The railway system's collapsing. You have to invest in success, not pay for failure, which is passenger charters doing. And he keeps on sitting there talking about monopoly. Nobody in Europe's worried about monopoly. They're worried about investment and good quality services. But surely your problem is, again, where do you get the money? Because surely the emphasis on the Labour budget was health and education. That's what's going to get the money. With transport sort of fairly far down. Yeah, but That's the priority. So how you, how you actually well, get the I money? Well, I mean, in the, in the uh, manifesto, we made absolutely clear that Kent Network train. Can I ask Mr Rifkin, is he going to finance that? If he is going to finance it, because we're going to use it for a leasing arrangement, we'll switch to another line. What about the other lines that are available for leasing? Europe does leasing, raises money in different ways on private sector. He's set his face against it because the Treasury won't allow him to do anything. So we're prepared to change those silly rules. Do what they do in Europe. Look at how we find the extra money from both the private and the public sector. That's how you'll get a quality railway. That's the way they've done it in Europe. That's where we intend to do it here. You mentioned your manifesto. You've said that the, the emphasis, there's a lot of emphasis on safety. Do you believe that transport is not safe at the moment? And if so, how, again, is, is this, again, you're going to have to put a lot of money into this? Well, it's how certainly not it as safe, safe as it should be. One thing is to have a kind of inquiries to find out what's going on. In Lockerbie, we never had a proper inquiry. There was something in Scotland, but not a proper one to what the Department of Transport. We had an announcement of an inquiry into the Titanic last week, and we can't get one into the Marchioness on the river. And yes, we have to take out the railway inspectors and the safety people and put it into an independent body. Body. We're going to do that. It doesn't cost you money, but we need to give a higher priority because that Department of Transport has been a deplorable re department on safety. We've seen terrible tragedies occur up in Scotland in his own area where we've had trains collide on the same line. I've campaigned against that. They've now agreed to go back to put them to two lines instead of one. I mean, there hasn't been that priority on safety, and I tell you what, that's going to be my first job to get back to a safe system. Well, Lord Todd is with us. Good morning, morning to you. Now, your policies have been called unrealistic and unaffordable. What would you say I to those charges? No, of course they're not. Um, can, can I begin at the beginning? The problem that we've had in the last few years is that the government hasn't had a transport strategy. And indeed, I, I asked one of the government ministers uh, whether they did have a strategy, and he replied, well, yes, we do. The government has a strategy for roads, and British Rail has a strategy for rail. And it seems to me that the, the point you've got to start is to have a, a, a national strategy for transport as a whole. You can't take it piecemeal. Mm -hmm. And that is what's been happening. Malcolm Rifkin this morning makes some brave remarks about shifting stuff from, uh, from road to rail. And, and indeed, I mean, in fairness to Malcolm Rifkin, he's been the only person in this last 13 years that's approached any sort of quality as a Secretary of State. Um, I, he could be better, and Mr. Prescott may be better or maybe worse, but I'd better be nice to both of them just in case I'm working alongside them a week yes, from indeed. now. Yes. Um, dreams, but dreams, <laughs> dreams. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you never know. It may be reality a week from now. Um, let me um, give you one instance of this. In, in the, my own county of Somerset, the, standi the standard spending assessment for the county this year has been increased by, I think, £980,000 in order to uh, cope with uh, an increase of 5% in, in heavy road traffic. Uh, that sort of money, taken from Somerset, Cornwall, Devon and, and uh, uh, other places, could actually provide the sort of freight links that we need in the South West in order to get stuff off the roads and onto rail. And this is where the government is, is failing to invest. I think Mr Prescott's quite right about the, the, the Treasury rules on these things. Mm. These have got to be changed as far as transport's concerned. We have to have more investment. We have to do everything we can to improve the infrastructure of, 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 the, of the railway network and, and integrate it with, or coordinate it, not necessarily integrate it, coordinate it with, with the road right. So network. where does your party go? Where, where will you come up with the money? Where's the money? Well, so far as urban transport is concerned, of course, we, we, we are in favour of, of going into road pricing. Right. We think that the only way to, to reduce the, the amount of traffic coming into our inner cities is not things like red routes, which, which uh, are really a gimmick uh, and are again uncoordinated. You have a, a, a traffic director with no powers, but road pricing has to be certainly examined in much more detail than it has been at the moment. And the money from that will certainly go a long way to improving the, our, our bus services, which are in decline both in, in the urban and in the rural areas. 
Yeah, on the, on the environment, on the environment as well. What will you actually do? Because we've said, you know, most people agree there's too many cars on yeah. the road. What, what will you actually do to stop that? What can you, what can you do? Well, I, th I think that people have got to be given the choice of using their cars or, or, or and make it attractive to use public transport. Some people need to use their cars. It, it, they, they can be liberating for people who can't use public transport. But everybody should be encouraged by both carrot and stick, I'm afraid, to, to use public transport wherever they can. And, and th there's a lot of money to be released from um, road pricing and, and other measures to do that. And certainly the environment is, is very much at the front of our minds in these questions. Well, gentlemen, thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you. Yep.